Okay, so tonight we're going to be covering um, chapter 18 uh, in, in real estate investments. And if we have time, we're going to knock out 19 as well. So we're going to try to knock them out. If we do that, then that will put us on track and we'll, we'll finish Friday. So we got to push through this tonight so we can finish Friday and be done. So that'll give us 20, 21, 22, and we're done. All right. So let's go on and let's push through this tonight. Let's get through our content um, so that we can get the ball rolling and keep things moving along. So our learning objectives in this chapter or this unit, we're going to explain the advantages and disadvantages of investing in real property or real estate. We're also going to describe the major components of the investment decision, uh, things like property appreciation, income potential, use of leverage and pyramiding is some of the, the benefits of real estate. We're also going to identify the key tax benefits of investing in real estate and distinguish the types of real estate investment syndicates uh, as well as trust. Okay, so with that being said, we're not going to spend a ton of time in this area just because of the fact is, is real estate investing trying to wrap it up and explain it all in one, say, one hour class is impossible. Okay, so we're going to hit the broad topics, just the stuff you need to know to get your license. But you will, as you get your real estate license, Mr. Eugene, you may decide, you know what, I like this subject. So there are plenty of other courses that go into this. Uh, and some of them can be weeks long, month long, certifications, there's a ton of them. Okay, so we're just going to hit the main point right here. So when dealing with real estate investment, Real estate assets and real estate securities are some of the basic ones, okay? Uh, and those are going to be things that we're going to kind of talk about. Now, the consideration of the prospective investors, so if you're deciding, say, for example, uh, Mr. Eugene, that you want to end up, you decide uh, that you want to basically be a prospective investor. Well, some of the pros in this situation is, is that, number one, the pro is it's above average rate of return usually. So unlike the normal, say for example, uh, let me add in this other one real quick. And like the, uh, the other one uh, in regards to real estate investing, the key thing into this situation is, is if you, Mr. Eugene, if you were to put some money into a bank account today, what's probably gonna be your interest rate, your rate of return that you're gonna get? What interest rate are you probably gonna get? If you say you put $10,000 into a bank, <laughs> So like 10%? No, 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 what's the max? Well, at least 5%, right? In a, in a savings account? <laughs> no, no. Well, it's got to be more than 2%. Yeah, it's probably less than that. Yeah. Some of them actually looked the other night. The average rate of return is about, if you're lucky, 0.25%. Okay? <clears throat> Which is nothing. Right. All right? So... When we come into this above average rate of return, normally I remember just kind of telling you for Bryan College Station and just Texas in general, I remember when my parents first moved to Bryan College Station, they bought their house for around 170, 175, and their house now is probably close to 300. Okay, and that's within about six years. All right, because of the fact is, is that property values have skyrocketed. Okay, and now people know what they have. So people are not putting their houses on the market. They're holding on to it, hoping for appreciation and get a higher rate of return. But Mr. Eugene, question for you. Say that you hold on to your property and you hold on to it for a long time. Does it mean that your property just continually just goes up, 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 up and just keeps going and never goes down? Oh yeah, it comes down bad. What happens with, if the economy crashes? What happens to your house? It drops too, okay? See, a lot of people right now, I was watching today, they're talking about Biden's, uh, his numbers in regards to approval rate, okay? And they were saying that 63% of the American population basically approved his job in regards to how he's doing with the stimulus packet, uh, coronavirus, and everything else. Now, in that situation, though, is that well, people, of course, we're all going to, if I, if I was to say, hey, everybody that's listening to me tonight, I'm going to give you all $5,000. I'm probably going to be the 
best professor ever in the world, okay? Because I gave y'all all money. But the thing is, is that what happens if I'm taking that $5,000 out of your cut of, say, for example, I, I increase commission or tuition and I make $10,000 a class, I give you $5,000 back, really what you're getting is your own money back, okay? And in that situation is, it truthfully takes money out of the economy. So in these situations, it's not always a positive when you get money. Of course, we all love free money. I'm not going to lie to you, too. Okay. But the thing is, is that as you continually give money, 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 what eventually happens? Well, if I, if I flood the market with a ton of cash, just like with housing, if I put a ton of housing, the value of the housing does what? It depletes. Okay. So the same concept applies in regards to this. So while on average, most of the time, you're going to have an above average rate of return. Now, there are also tax benefits. You can take tax deductions, and especially in regards to, like Mr. Eugene and, and Mr. Jacob probably knows, and, and everyone else that deals with investing, you get deductions. So if you have to do repairs to your house, you got to pay property manager, you got to pay for leasing, you got to pay for all this stuff, you can take deductions off your taxes. So if, for example, Mr. Jacob, say he makes $500,000 a year from his job, he's W-2, well, he makes $500,000, but he makes improvements to his investment. Some of those can be deductible, which brings down his overall income, which he pays less taxes into the government, and he's ending up increasing the value of his houses. Okay, So there are benefits that come along with uh, property investment. Also, there's a, normally a hedge to inflation. As prices go up, so does the property value, okay? You can also leverage funds. So say, for example, that Mr. Garrett wants to go out and he wants to buy, a, I've had an investor that used to do this, it's very difficult now, but I used to have an investor, actually, I'm gonna pick on Darren. Say Darren calls me up back in the day and he'd say, hey, Justin, I wanna buy some properties. I said, all right, Darren, how much money you got? Well, I got about, you know, $30,000 sitting in my pocket, in my bank, 30 grand. How much house can I get for that? I said, well, you got to put 20% down on an investment, not three and a half. So you can end up in that situation. If you got $30,000, you can probably on average, basically, let's say it'd be 3,000 or 300, 16, 15, 15. Probably, Darren, you'd probably buy about $150,000 house, okay? So in that situation, he brings in about $150,000 house. We can buy him with that $30,000 he got. All right. So Darren goes over. He says, all right, I want to buy a house. So we go buy him a house. He purchases said house, puts his $30,000 into it, and he rents it out. Now, here's something a lot of people don't know, is that if he rents it out, say he rents it out to Stephen here, and Stephen is, he's paying, Stephen's paying $2,000 a month for that house, okay? which we wish them all was that easy, okay? But Stephen's paying two grand a month for the house that he's got. Well, as Stephen's paying, Darren gets to add that to his monthly income, all right? Because that's payments being made. So he's paying Darren 2,000 a month. Say Darren's bringing in 2,000. So right now, how much has Darren got? $4,000, even though He's not, he's paying a payment. You don't work for him, but he's making payments. That's still $4,000 a month. Now, what happens, Mr. Eugene, in regards to, say, for example, that house that Darren's bought? Does it just go down in value? No, what does it do? It goes up. So say after two years, that, that $150,000 house, Darren, now is worth 200000 Okay? Now, and also within that time frame, Darren has paid it from one fifty. dollars down to 100. He put a ton of money into it. Well, how much equity does he have in that house now? $100,000. Now, Darren wants to go buy some more properties. So Darren calls his lender. He says, I would like to end up purchasing more properties. I have a hundred thousand in equity, plus I have a renter that's still renting at 2,000 a month. How much can I get? Well, they say you have to put 20% down. So what could he end up doing? <clears throat> He's got 100,000 in equity that he can leverage against his house to do what? To go buy more houses, okay? So he could get up in that situation and he may buy 
two or three more $150,000 houses. And then he rents them out and he ends up does what? He has more tenants that are paying and he keeps building and building and building. While it's a great deal, I can tell you right now, very difficult for that to happen unless you have excellent credit and you've been doing it for a while and you got the experience and all. Most banks right now, just because of our economic situation, is not really wanting to do much leverage. Because what happened in 2008 was say that Darren ended up had 15 houses and he's leveraged every one of them. Well, then that situation is, God forbid, all of his tenants move out, Darren loses his job, what happens? Well, if all of them are leveraged, he can't pay them, and what ends up happening to them? What do they do, Stephen? They foreclose, and they'll take them all. Okay. So when you're going through these situations, it's fine to leverage your property, but understand with your leverage, you want to make certain that you're leveraging it properly. Now, should a real estate agent ever, ever, ever give financial advice? No. Okay. Not even, let me ask you this, Mr. Uh, Mr. Eugene. What if Stefan here, he's been leveraging properties for 10 years. He kind of knows how it all works. He's got it down. He got this all down. Should Stefan give you advice? Well, he's got 10 years of doing it. That's not his expertise. That's not what he's licensed in. That's not what he's licensed. He can say, I have been doing this but what would be the best situation? What should he do? What do you think you should do, Stephen? You know it. Who should you hook that person? If Mr. Eugene wants to get into what you're doing, who should you hook Mr. Eugene up with? You borrow money. You hook them up with a lender. You hook them up with a lender that deals with this type of finance. And not every lender is the same. A lot of people think the only way you can get a mortgage is what? You got to go to a bank, okay? But let me tell you something. There are people, say Mr. Jacob, say Mr. Jacob has a million dollars just sitting in his bank account, and he, he's been leveraging it on. He's like, man, I've got 50 properties, and I want to go over here in this situation, and I don't want to have to buy any more properties. Well, what could he end up doing? What could he do? He could say, Mr. Eugene, I'll finance you. And I'll let you go through this situation, and he can be able to provide funds. He could be an independent investor. Okay. So in some of these situations, sometimes an investor may find out that just having a house, they may not just want to do that. They may. What, what did you always tell me, Mom, back in the day? You always said, "Do you put all your eggs in one basket?" Why do you say no? You need to have them in different baskets. What, why is that? Though? Why do I need to put them in different areas? Because of the fact that if one goes down, you have the other one to fall back to. That's right. So in that situation is, back in the 1980s, Mr. Eugene, I got a question for you. Back in the 1980s, uh, was interest rates good for savings accounts? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you go put some money in a, in a bank in 1980s, and you'd probably get double-digit return. 10.25. 10.25. Yeah. So in these situations, is there were some benefits to it, right? Okay. So again, like I said, it's not everything stays the same. Now today, 0.25 if you're lucky, okay? Some of them 0.025, okay? So again, you gotta go through those. Again, you can also build up equity in a property, but the key thing I always tell people is, is you don't make financial decisions based off of someone that is not an expert in finances. Just because Stefan may tell you, Mr. Eugene, that, hey, it's a great idea, go invest in this property. Stefan is still not well versed in that, okay? You wanna bring somebody that's in, you want to have multiple, multiple uh, people that are going in there, okay, that are looking at this. It needs to be a collaborative effort. Now, what are the cons? Well, the cons is that it's illiquid, meaning the fact is, is that you cannot quickly convert your property into cash. So if Darren ends up, he's got a lot of properties, he has no cash, and there's a major repair to the property, what happens? It's a big issue, okay? Also, there are risks, not just with the property, but with also the tenants. I did property management for a long time. I'm so glad I'm out of it. A lot of people try to get me back into it 
And I say, heck no, it's not worth it. Okay. The risk is, of course, we understand the risk with financial risk, but there's also the risk that, say, Steph and Mr. Eugene, he's in your property, he's written it, and you, he can't pay you, so he calls you and says, hey, you know, I can't pay you this month, can I pay you next month? And you say, heck no, you're going to pay me now. And and he ends up, you're going to pay me now, and Stephen says, I can't, and so you serve him with an eviction notice. Oh. Are you happy with Mr. Eugene? So what are you going to do to the property? Vandalize he's, it. Well, not just vandalize, he's going to take him, his little happy self down to this place called Lowe's. Have any of you ever heard that? <laughs> yeah, it goes down to Lowe's, and he walks on in there, and what do you buy, Mr. Uh, Stephen? A big old bag of concrete. A big old bag of concrete, cement. <laughs> So he's going to walk go over there, and he's going to buy that, and he's going to go back to your house. And what you going to do, Mr. Stephan? I'm going to put it all down the toilets. He's going to flush them down the toilets for you. Not much. And then, like Miss Linda said, after he's finished, he's going to vandalize the property. He's going to destroy it. And then by the time you get him evicted, Mr. Eugene, guess what happens? You got a ton, a ton, a ton of, of repairs that you got to pay. And if he can't even pay you rent, what's the chances you're going to get any money out of him? Mm -hmm. Very slim. Okay? So that's when you got to call Darren in and say, hey, Darren, uh, I need you to come repair all my plumbing for me because uh, my tenant flushed concrete down. And he's going to tell you, Mr. Eugene, that's going to be a ton of money. Okay? So, again, there are risks. <laughs> Another thing is, is there's changes in laws. Remember we talked about zoning. It may end up, Mr. Eugene, that property may be zone residential, but they may end up coming in and saying, well, we've now just changed it, just like here in College Station. We're changing it where you can no longer have more than two unrelated individuals uh, in your property. So while you were able to rent it out to four college kids, guess how many you get to rent it out to now? Two. What happened to your, uh, your rent, Mr. Eugene? You just cut it in half. Okay. So in those situations is, you have to watch these changes in the law. There's also the possibility of negative cash flow. There is a situation that you may put more money, especially in an older property, you may be putting more money into that property than what you're getting. You may have a 1980s, 1960s, 1940s house, and guess what? Especially if you have an old home that had a different type of electrical wiring, Guess what? You may have to update the wiring throughout the entire house. How cheap is that, Miss Linda? Not very. Not very cheap at all. Okay. It also will require personal attention of the investor unless they're going to hire an expert. Okay. So in this situation is, if you're if you want to manage your properties, great. But the thing is, is that. It requires personal attention, which takes away what from you, Mr. Eugene, if you're an investor? It takes your time. And if you're working a full-time job and you got 50 houses that you're renting out, you're going to be able to do it. You're going to quit your job. Okay? And again, like it always says, is you're going to have to have expert advice. And to get expert advice, do you have to pay for that? Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. Okay? Now, also, one of the key things is that it does, though, for investment purposes, we are trying to get what's called appreciation, which means values go up, okay, through inflation or intrinsic value. There's also the purpose is income. We want to basically have cash flow or cash flow management. And what this basically comes down to is you want that mailbox money. What's mailbox money, Stephen? When it sits in the mailbox? Nope. What's mailbox money, Mr. Eugene? When it comes in from your tenants. Man, money that comes in for how much work did you have to do for it? No. Oh. Nothing. So the key thing in this situation is you want to have mailbox money because mailbox money is you sit at home and it just money just keeps on coming in. Just floods on in. Okay. Also tax shelters. Sometimes, Mr. Eugene, you might have a lot of money and you don't want to have to pay taxes in it. So you may want to be, be able in this situation to put money into this property so that you're not having to pay the tax man. Okay, if you're making a lot of money like Darren, you know, probably a few million a day, okay, uh, in that situation, you want a tax shelter, okay? And again, that's the deductibility of interest and other expenses. 
as well as depreciation. Again, we talked about leverage. It's basically the use of borrowed funds. You make a small down payment, get the lowest interest rate, and you obtain the longest mortgage term. Okay. So the key thing in this situation, people always ask me, they say, you know, why my thing is not in houses, but I like to buy cars. And one of the things is people say, why in the world are you leveraging? Pay off your cars. That's one thing my mother used to always tell me, my father too, pay off your debts. Well, here's the thing. Not always do you want to pay off your debt. Okay. Because the fact is, Mr. Eugene, let's think about this. Say you bought a house and in that situation is you pay for your house that you build, you pay three and a half percent down. So you pay on a hundred thousand dollar house for $3,500 and over 30 years, you pay 2% interest. Okay. So on a hundred thousand dollars, 2% interest over 30 years, you're only going to pay, let's say $20,000 in, in interest. Now, Mr. Eugene, $20,000 in interest, or for say, not even 20, let's say 10, because it's a hundred thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars in interest. Okay. Is that a lot of money really? Over 30 years? No. So in that situation is guess what happens? You're gonna have the longest mortgage, low interest rate, small down payment. But what else are you doing, Mr. Eugene? You're building equity. So if you keep adding on to that house and putting value into it, putting value into it, and putting that, what happens to your debt? What's going on? Well, your debt's doing this, and when you fix it up and appreciate it, what's it doing? It's going up. So maybe in a year, that 10,000 in interest, you might have already made it in appreciation. Two more years, you've already doubled it, tripled it, and it keeps on going while this is going down. So sometimes, you know, while people always say, well, I need to pay off my debts, you don't always have to pay your debts off, okay? Not always is that the point. Now, if you have a very high interest rate, you want to pay them off. But sometimes, a lot of people always get into this. You know, even Stefan here, he'll talk to me. You know, he wants to pay his car off. Okay, I'll pay it off, pay it off, pay it off. Well, not always is that a wise choice, especially if you have a low interest rate. If you owe one, two, three percent interest, that's a steal. And you really calculate it over the term that you have the loan, that's actually a real good steal because what happens, Mr. Grossman, you've got more money in your pocket. So for example, say you automatically today, say your rest of your loan was $10,000. You put $10,000 to pay off your car. Well, what happens with that value of that car? Does it go up or go down? So it goes down. Well, what could you have done if you kept that $10,000? Could you put it into your business? And what could you have done with that money? Could you possibly have doubled it, tripled it? Yeah. So in some of these situations, you've got to always look at how you're doing it. This is why I tell people, See, I'm able to advise because I have a lot of training in these areas, but a lot of times a real estate agent doesn't know that. And so, like my mother always taught me, pay your debts off, pay your debts off, pay your debts off. Not always the truth, because sometimes if you take the money you got and you invest it, sometimes you can triple, if not quadruple that money and be set financially. Okay. So equity build up. You can also build up. That's basically the repayment of the principal, appreciation of the value. And also the equity in some situations, uh, you can, I can see it, can't see the word, you can have an equity decrease, okay? Now, pyramiding, that's kind of what I was telling you about earlier, where you kind of take loans out and you buy another house, pyramiding through refinancing. So it's refinance one property and it releases the equity used to buy more property. And that's what I was talking about earlier. There are tax benefits that come into this. <coughs> the uh, capital gains tax, this is very key here. A lot of people don't understand this. See, say that Miss Leela, say that she and her husband, uh, and, and I can tell you this, because this probably happens to at least 80% of the people that I know or that I've known over my years, a lot of people do not have a real estate investor or a real estate agent that consults with them. But a lot of people, they'll buy a house and they'll stay in that house until they die. Okay, and a lot of people that will in some situations, they'll only buy one or two houses in their lifetime. Okay, because they think that I, you know, I got to pay this off. I can't stay here. I need to pay it off. Well, say Miss Leela and her husband are in their first home and she's been there for 10 years. She ends up, she runs into this crazy guy named Justin Nobles one day. I'm sorry for you. And, and she ended up, 
Uh, she goes over and Justin tells her, says, well, Miss Lilo, how long have you been in your house? And she says, well, I've been there for 10 years. Well, you know, why are you, why didn't you move on? Why don't you get a bigger house? Why don't you, you know, upgrade? Well, I got to pay off my house because I don't want to have to pay a ton in taxes. And I said, well, Miss Lilo, you bought your house for $100,000 back in the day. And now your house is worth $500,000. Why don't you sell it and get you a bigger house? And Miss Lila says, well, you know, I got to pay off my debts. And I say, no, Miss Lila, I say, let me explain something to you. And I put this nice little chart up here, okay? And I show Miss Lila and I say, Miss Lila, I said, do you see that word right there that says basis? That is what you bought your house for. So if you paid $100,000, Miss Lila, that is your basis, that's your cost to purchase that house. So it's $100,000. Now, Miss Lila also understand that we do have this word called an adjusted basis. And that's where you take that cost, that 100,000, and you put in, say, 20,000 in improvements. But there was depreciation on that house over the 10 years, which knocks off that 20,000 and puts you back down to 100,000. So you're still sitting at 100,000. So Ms. Leela, if you sell your house for $500,000, and you pay the real estate agent and you subtract this basis up here, that's your capital gain. So if you sold it and all this comes down, say you sold it and walked away with $400,000, how much money would Ms. Leela have to pay in capital gains tax on $400,000? How much do you think, Mr. Eugene? It's a big goose egg, zero. Because Ms. Leela is married since she's married, each individual person can deduct off of a house $250,000. So if you're married, you could, she could sell her house for $600,000, paid a hundred, and walked away with $500,000 in her bank account, and she would not have to pay one red penny to the government. But don't you have to turn around if you do that, you have a certain amount of years to No, ma'am. No, ma'am. That is her money. That is because she's not doing what's called a 1031 exchange. She's selling her main residence. So she is selling her property. She walks away with $500,000. That goes in her back pocket to go spend it. Okay. So what happens, guys and gals, we'll give you a little side story here. I have a lot of builders that work with me. I have one that actually works as an agent with me. This is what her and her husband do. They use this advice to financially make very smart decisions. And what they do is, is they will build a house and because they're a builder, they end up, they basically build it themselves. They buy the land, they build on it. They live in it for two years. They, so say that they cost to build that property and say they want a $500,000 property. Well, that's retail, 500,000 retail. They build it for 300, okay? So they build it for 300 out of their own pocket. They turn around at $300,000. They go live in the property for two years. While they're there, they continue to upgrade it, make it look nice, keep it in very nice condition. And after two years, they put it on the market. They put it on the market. They'll put it on the market, say $800,000. Okay. Now, how much was their cost to build? 300. They put it on the market for 800 and it sells for $800,000. How much money did they walk away with? Half a million, 500,000. They take that $500,000 and then what do they do? Go build another one. But this time they now have 300, they got their 300 back plus an additional 500. So now they have $800,000. Well, they have $800,000. They go build another house at $800,000, build it, live in it for a few years, turn around, put it on the market for 1.5 million sell it still within there say they're five well they're 200 over because they're 800 and 200 over well they get 500 but they pay taxes on the 200 and then guess what do it all over okay so the key thing is is that you can get exemptions from capital gains if you're a single individual you only get how much money 250,000. if you're married you get up to 500. And no, Darren, that doesn't mean if you got a ton of women that you're married or you're trying to marry, you can't marry a bunch and get, you know, 250 for 50 women, okay? Heather, don't let him do that. So, <laughs> but 
the key thing is I've had a student actually ask me that before. They said, well, does that mean I can get a bunch of spouses and then I just get 250 for everyone? No, you only get one spouse plus yourself, period. Okay. Uh, but in that situation is you can get these tax advantage, advantages. Again, depreciation, you do in some of these situations, uh, you do have income tax as well as recovery costs for any investments to put into it. So all of these are ultimately other items that you can end up uh, that you benefit in regards to taxes. We also, in this situation, we do have what's called the direct reduction, or not, sorry, the installment sales. The installment sales is where you receive payments and installments over two or more years. They pay income tax on each year based on the amount received in that particular year, okay? Um, so in this situation is, you do also get tax credits that are direct reduction in the taxes that are due, and they're generally going to end up being low, low income housing projects or historic properties, okay? There are additional credits that are out there. Again, you wanna bring a tax professional in with you on this particular transaction, okay? You wanna have somebody that knows what they're aware of. Now, Ms. Linda, this comes back to that situation on the top one here that you were talking about. You're saying once they get their money, how much money do they have to end up or how quickly do they have to sell it? Well, a 1031 exchange is say, for example, that, um, that Garrett, he owns a property, okay? Garrett owns a property, Garrett wants to sell said property and he wants to buy a newer one. So Stefan, he ends up, you've just built a brand new property, 2021, beautiful property. Garrett has a 1980s house uh, but their value is about the same. The only difference is the square footage and the yard size is a little bit different, okay? Well, he can sell his property and do a like-kind exchange to buy your property, but he can never put the money in his bank account. You have to use a third-party vendor, okay, a person that's approved by the IRS to hold said money until there is a like-kind exchange, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Now, taxes are deferred in these transactions, but they're not eliminated, all right? And they must be like-kind property, and that's very key. You cannot take a home and go get a farm, okay? It's got to be like-kind. Any monies that are over, said that, say, for example, that uh, there's Garrett transfers his property, he buys yours, Stefan. He sold his for 200, yours was 190. Well, he sells it, well, there's $10,000 extra. That's called a boot, okay? It's a boot. I mean, there's additional money and that money is then taxed, okay? At the rate that it has to be taxed at. Now, again, there are net debt reliefs as well as in some of these situations, there is old property is oftentimes gonna be relinquished property and new property is gonna be the replacement property. And those are the terms that we often use. Again, there are three methods when dealing with the 1031 exchange. <laughs> There is the direct simultaneous exchange. It's where you're selling both of them together. There is a delayed exchange and a reverse exchange. Each one of these gives you different methods, okay? But again, should you, Stefan, as a real estate agent, explain these to your clients as a real estate agent? No, you can explain and tell them what it is, but what should you end up doing? You advise them to find somebody that is that is able to do these 1031 exchange. One of the key things that I love about this, it's a win-win for the investors, it's a win-win for the real estate agent. Say for example that, um, say Miss Leela has some property, okay? And she ends up, she's an investor, she has some property that she's been held, holding on to. And her real estate agent is a little bit outdated on advice, okay? So Ms. Leela is a little bit, her agent doesn't keep her up to date on this whole 1031 exchange. So she comes and I run into her and I say, hey, Ms. Leela, I said, you know, you got a lot of older properties here. You know, I see the values are here, but there's a lot of money to put into this thing for you to bring them up to a good cash value. Why don't you put them on the market and sell them and then turn around and purchase either newer ones or brand new ones, okay? And she said, well, I can't do that because I'd have to pay taxes. And I say, no, no, no. If you do a 1031 exchange, a 1031 exchange allows you to sell your properties and then take that money, buy another property that's in a better location, 
Maybe it's basically a newer property, whatever you want to do with it, but you can buy a property similar to it and you can turn into that situation. You can turn around and buy that property and have a newer property to manage. She's like, well, I didn't even know about that. And I say, yeah. So we go through and guess what is a real estate agent. What can I do there, Steph? And what opportunity does that put me as an agent by me providing her that information? She's going to use me to sell it. So I put, say she has 15 properties. I get to put my sign out 15 times. And what ends up happening there? You never get any time to yourself for the next few months because you'll be cold. I'm going to be busy. But what happens? That's 15 of them. And not only am I representing her in the sale, but what also am I getting to do? She's going to buy too. So what does that guarantee me? I'm getting how much percent total over everything? 6%. You see how this can be a win-win, okay? So 1031 exchange can be one of the best things that you can end up using as a real estate agent. Again, the direct simultaneous exchange is where two people trade their properties in one transaction. That comes into that situation, Miss Linda, you have an older home, Seven's got a brand new one, you want his, he wants yours. Y'all can simultaneously close and switch properties, okay? It can, uh, cannot occur if owned and new properties are not both identified, though, at the same time, meaning that we have to make certain, that's key in 1031 exchange, Ms. Linda, you have to designate that you want to buy his property, and you have to designate that you want to buy her property. Does that make sense? Y'all can't get in the process to sell and then say after the fact that, okay, well, I'm going to call this a direct simultaneous exchange. That's why if a person wants to do 1031 exchange, what's the very first thing that they need to do? They should go talk to a person that is licensed to end up doing 1031 exchange before they go and put their properties on the market. Does that make sense? Okay. A delayed exchange is where old property is sold and then say, Miss Linda, you sold your property and then Miss Linda goes and finds Stefan. So I bought your property, Miss Linda, okay? Now there's money sitting in Mr. Jacob, who's your 1031 agent. He's holding on to your, your money. And I use, I bought the property, he's holding your money. And then you go find Stefan's property and you want to buy it. This is the delayed exchange. So in this situation is the old property sold, the new one is found. And then you have within 45 days from when me and you close to identify your replacement property. Okay. You miss that time frame. Guess what happens? It gets taxed. Okay, so you got to stay on top of this. <clears throat> so the uh, requirements is, is there is a three property rule, the two hundred percent rule, and the ninety five percent rule. We're going to talk about those later on. There is a hundred eighty day rule, which is the time limit to close on that new property. So guess what? Say that you're Miss Linda. You have closed with me in January. You have 45 days to identify possible replacement properties. If you do not close on those identified properties, guess what happens? You may end up getting taxed on it. That's why it's very important that you get as many properties identified because if it's one that's not identified, you may not be able to claim it. Okay? So if your client says, well, I'm just going to pick one property. Nope, don't work like that. There needs to be multiple. Okay, and your tax advisor should explain that to you. Now, again, you have six months from when you closed to get a new one. You don't, you get penalized. Again, all, and this is that part right here down the bottom, all funds must pass through a third party qualified intermediary. Now, I myself am working on getting that credential, but here's the thing. If I become a third party qualified um, intermediary, I cannot also be the broker on the transaction. I have to be third party, which means I cannot be a party to the transaction at all. All right. And I can tell you there are few people, but let me explain something here. Getting your third party qualified intermediary status is not something to take lightly. You better know the tax law. You don't know the tax law, you'll pay for it very pretty. Okay. Because if you screw something up, it can really royally screw you overall. Now, the other thing is, 
is that it requires that title names on the or names on the title on the new property must match the names on the old property. So Miss Linda, if you were selling your property and you sold it and you're buying Stephens and you want to put Eugene Nobles on it, well, guess what happens? It won't work because it can only be the same party that was on it with the old property. You cannot add somebody to it or make it an LLC. Okay. The reinvestment is basically done to avoid capital gains taxes. And it's because this is not your residence, this is your investment. So again, this does not allow you that exemption of $250,000 or $500,000. These are investment properties. So to avoid those capital gains, you're switching out properties. Okay. And this happens a lot. I deal with this in investors all the time. Um, to, uh, again, to avoid it, the new property must have equal or higher value than the old one. And all equity must be reinvested in new property and new property must have equal or more debt than the old one. All right. A reverse exchange is where new property is found and then the old property is sold. And this is where the exchange accommodation title holder is going to be required. The rules, however, for this are very much more complicated than the delayed exchange. And if you're going to do something like this, it is highly recommended you talk to somebody before you even do anything. Okay. When I talk to people all the time, I tell them, you need to make certain that you're planning properly. So careful planning is crucial in any 1031 exchange. And you enter into it only with professional assistance. Do not trust. I've had a, an investor do this before. He was working with a realtor. Realtor had only been in business two years. And the realtor went out and started giving all this advice, okay, and was basically saying, oh, yeah, yeah, just go on Google and look up here, Google this and Google that, and Google, 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 okay? Well, how many of you going to do brain surgery on yourself with Google as your uh, your assistant? You going to do that, Stefan? No, right? So the same concept is, is that we don't want to use Google for any financial planning decisions, okay? The Tax Reform Act of 1986, it basically limits the deductibility of losses from rental property. There are two categories of investors. There are active and passive, all right? Active is very much what it sounds like. You're basically, you're involved. So you are actively involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business, and you make the decisions, the hiring, and all that. You make all those decisions yourself. Passive is what it sounds like. It's where, say that my parents, Mr. Eugene, Miss Linda, say, you know what? We want to spend some money or buy into your company. So we want to give you $500,000, but we want 25% of all profits. Well, in that situation, Mr. Grossman, are they doing anything for their money? No. What are they doing? They just put money into the business. And then what ended up happening? They get money. For the rest of their time, they got 25% ownership. So every sale, they get 25%. Okay. So they contribute investment money, but they have no voice in the management operations. Okay. And that's another situation is the difference between active and passive. Okay. Now, an active investor may deduct up to 25,000 of loss to offset the income from any source. Okay. There's a hundred thousand dollar maximum taxable income before the rental loss deduction is taken to be eligible for the full deduction. Okay. While a passive investor in this particular situation, they offset their investment losses against their income. Okay. A real estate professional does not, or real estate professionals are not subject to passive loss limitations though. If here's the thing, they materially participate in the activities. They spend at least 750 hours in real property business and perform more than 50% of personal services in their real property business. So we do not have passive loss limitations. I'm pretty much open to take as many losses as I want, so long as I can account for them. Does not mean that I can make up stuff. Okay, that's what I tell people all the time. That in this business, you can take losses. Okay. However, you cannot just think, I get people that do this a lot and say, well, I think that I spent $5,000, you know, uh, last month in eating out. You think or you know? 
Well, I think it was. Well, where's your proof? Well, I don't have it. Well, if you don't have it, what's that mean, Stephen? If you don't show it, can't show that amount, can you take that deduction? No, no you've got to have the documentation. Okay. There are also what we call investment syndicates. This is where there are pool resources to own property. Okay, and these are people that have tenancy in common, partnership or corporation, or even a trust. There are private syndications and public syndications. There are two different types. There are also blue sky laws as well as uh, securities laws. The key point in these situations that you need to be aware of with syndicates is that it's oftentimes people are pulling money together to purchase property. So say, for example, Stephanie, you want to buy some property, Eugene and Linda and myself and everybody else that's listening, we all want to buy some property, okay? Well, here's the thing. If we are using these investment syndicates, guess what happens? We're putting it all in, but we are then splitting it amongst how much ownership we have it, okay? Now, this one's one of my favorite. I actually have some of these. Uh, it's basically what we call a REIT, a real estate investment trust. I, like I said myself, I'm involved in these. Uh, but it's one of the key thing is, is that it is no corporate income tax. If 90% of the income is distributed, 100 more investors are involved and 75% of the assets are real estate or related assets. Um, I actually, like I said, I've got ownership in a lot of different properties through uh, REITs. This is the best way to get ownership interest. While you do have ownership interest, you don't get to just go over there, okay? I have ownership interest in apartment complexes. I have ownership interest in commercial sky rises. I got them everywhere, okay? But the thing is, does that mean, Miss Linda, that I can just go into those buildings and set up shop? No. No, I'm owning what? I'm owning interest into a trust, okay? I do not own the building I own into that trust. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the key thing I will tell you with this is that it is very expensive to get involved. There's one site that I can help y'all if anybody's interested uh, that you can invest in, uh, but it also has a very high risk of losing. So you don't want to put a ton of money in here. Um, there are investment uh, vehicles that are also utilized, and we'll talk about those as we progress throughout this class. Um, well, they've already got them up here, too. The three investments is you have your equity REIT, your mortgage REIT, and a combination. Now, I personally am dealing with the top one, equity REIT, which is where you buy and sell large-scale investment properties. Uh, this is where you actually are buying the properties, okay? You're not going in and uh, just buying a mortgage. You're actually buying the property. Um, the mortgage real estate investment trust, these are where you're just buying notes, kind of like the secondary market where they're selling them but you're buying mortgages. And then there's a combination where you can invest in properties and mortgages. Uh, but again, you have to be aware of what your financial goals are. Don't just throw money in without knowing what you're doing. Okay, one of the key things. There's also the real estate mortgage investment conduits. Uh, this is where there are tax device that allows the cash flow from a block of commercial mortgages to be passed directly on to investors. This allows for people to go in and buy into these different places uh, and end up in that particular situation. They can kind of get started through these different areas. All right. With that being said, Mr. Grossman, can you hold on just a second? Can you go ahead and, uh, and stop this recording?